This past weekend, Jessica Jones season three dropped on Netflix, and that means it's time to stop and rank all 13 Marvel Netflix seasons from the worst to the best one last time. Hi, if you're new here, my name is Sean Chandler, and I started this channel because I was driving everyone around me crazy talking about movies and TV way too much. If you can relate, you're probably in the right place to consider clicking that subscribe button. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. Share your ranking of all the Marvel Netflix seasons, or at least the ones that you've seen. We're going to disagree. That's the fun part where we can exchange ideas. Just don't be rude or a jerk about it. One final thing before we get started, people ask me constantly where I get my posters, my Funkos, and what gear I use to shoot my videos. There's a link down below in the description that answers all those questions as to what I use and where you can get it. With that said, let's get started. Coming in in last place is Iron Fist Season 1. This season is simply not good and a big reason for that is that they got Scott Buck to be the showrunner and he's infamously one of the worst showrunners out there. He's the guy that ran the final season of Dexter, which is terrible. He's the guy that ran the first season of The Inhumans, which is terrible. Terrible, and he's the guy that created this season, which is not very good. It has one of the worst intros to a television show that I've ever seen in that uh, Danny Rand just shows up, awkwardly walks into a building, and then this leads into four episodes of him in like legal disputes about is he it, who he says he is and stuff like that, as opposed to being about fighting crime and superheroes and stuff like that. Another reason that this show doesn't work very well is that Danny Rand as a character, I don't think is characterized very well. They couldn't identify exactly what made him special and what was kind of his defining characteristics. And add to that the performance, I just don't think has the weight to run and drive a TV show forward. And so you have this guy at the center that's not very interesting, plays awkwardly with other people, and the actor just does not command your attention. Add to that, it's kind of a martial arts show, and when you have Daredevil in the same universe, by comparison, it's just not nearly as good a fight choreography, and it should be the standout point, but it's kind of just kind of mediocre and meh. One thing that I did enjoy about this season is that we got to dive a little bit deeper into the hand, see them from some different perspectives and there's different factions inside of it. Some people, a part of it, are actually pretty good people. I thought that that was a nice touch. I did enjoy those aspects. Some of the fights are okay, but everything else is very... <laughs> bad. At number 12 is Jessica Jones season two. After a strong first season and a nice showing inside of the Defenders, they kind of decided, I think, the exact wrong direction to take the character. One of the things that worked well about the first season was the exploration of her traumatic past. And instead of having the character move forward, they doubled down on exploring her traumatic past and now digging into her family and her parents and the tragedy that caused her. It just feels like instead of moving forward, they keep looping her backwards and exploring what made her who she is right now. And I think it would be better to see her grow. Another thing that bothered me about this season is that there's no strong, compelling villain. Her mom has some villainous aspects and needs to be stopped in certain things she's doing, and there's certain mysteries that need to be unraveled. But there's not someone out there with an evil scheme that Jessica Jones has to stop. There's nothing, no one like Purple Man or even the bad guy in season three. And so it just kind of feels like we're meandering with these characters. And part of the problem here is that they wanted to do this exploration of broken heroes and everyone has a backstory. But by layering on the brokenness so heavy on everyone, everyone's just kind of unlikable. So we're spending a lot of time going nowhere with people that I don't really like. And then adding to that the plot line about her mother having powers as well, I think could have been really compelling. It's a nice addition to explore Jessica Jones from a different perspective, so it should be really good, but without that villain to create something that we're moving forward or a scheme we're trying to stop, there's no forward momentum, there's no urgency, we're just kind of sitting there with these people that, as I said, I didn't really like. So for me, this season was a slog to get through. Coming in at number 11 is Luke Cage season two. For me, this was a very frustrating misfire. Now, I actually liked the Bushwhacker character and the actor that played him. I thought as a power set and a bit of a backstory, he was a nice person to face off against Luke Cage. The actor himself, I think just has a presence that kind of commands your attention and some of just his eyes are kind of mesmerizing. So I liked seeing 
him in the show, but it felt like the season was more interested in moral complexities than a compelling story. So we're showing how our bad guys have a backstory and a good side to them, and our good guys have a bad side, and they're drawn towards evil, and we're doing all this back and forth kind of moral ambiguity stuff, but there wasn't a big evil scheme that they were trying to stop. There wasn't something moving the fo story forward. There wasn't something creating urgency or stakes. Our villains do some villainous things, but they're not pushing our character, our lead character, to have to try and stop them desperately that gets me invested in shows like this. Add to that, there were just some strange decisions in the mix, whether you're talking about the love relationship between Maria and Shades just seemed like a really odd kind of direction to take things. And then the show ends at a point with um, where they put Luke Cage and taking over certain things that I just thought was baffling. It didn't feel earned. It didn't feel like that's what we were building towards. And to end the series there is a very unfortunate place for things to end. Kicking off our top 10 is Iron Fist season two. This was a huge improvement over the first season. Right off the bat, we got much better fight choreography as well as more fights inside of this season. Our central story about Davos, his jealousy, the backstory between him and, and Rand, I think all that worked really nicely. Adding to that, Danny doesn't want the power and the back and forth with all of that. I just thought, was pretty interesting. Add to that, Alice Eve as Typhoid Mary, I thought was a nice addition. In fact, I like the character enough. I wish she'd kind of been on one of the other shows than on this one to use the character a little bit better. But the problem here is that I just don't find these characters or this world all that interesting. They messed up the setup so bad in season one that I'm just not invested in this world. So while this was a pretty big improvement, I just didn't care all that much and I wasn't very invested. Number nine is The Defenders. This should have been this big event, exciting series that we talk about it the way that people talk about the Avengers movies. And unfortunately, that's not really what this was. Now, some of the fight sequences are very cool to get to see all of the different strengths and skills of our heroes in a single sequence. Very cool stuff. I enjoyed some of the banter between our heroes when they finally got all together, but the actual story and pacing were kind of a total mess. The first episode was shockingly slow. I was so excited going into this series and I was like, wait, that was the first episode? That's all they did, wow. <laughs> I'm not as excited about this as I was before. The Hand, I don't, they, as a mysterious organization, I think they work really well in this world, but when they're kind of put up front and center, they didn't find a way to personalize it enough to have someone that we wanted to see defeated, and so they're not all that interesting. They're just kind of dull because they don't have that main villain. Now, they hired Sigourney Weaver to be one of our main people driving the hand forward, and I was, once again, very excited about that because she's Sigourney Weaver and then they kill her off halfway through the season and you don't really have anyone nearly compelling enough to drive things forward. So our villains, you just don't care too much about them. So while the season had some very cool moments, it was nice to see everybody together a really big disappointment over it. Next up is Jessica Jones season three. Now I'll say this, there's a pretty big gap in quality from the Defenders to this season. I, I enjoyed this season a good bit. It was a big improvement over season two. And a big part of that is that it got back to Jessica Jones being a private investigator. The investigations, her trying to catch people, find things out, looking into things is a major part of this season. She's not just trying to fight crime, she's working with police officers, turning over evidence, things like that. There's a nice return to form. Likewise, the big thing that pushed this one forward for me is that there's an actual villain that you find despicable, <laughs> that you want him brought down, and our characters are like having a battle of wits trying to outmaneuver him so he can actually be arrested and brought to justice. So it had urgency, momentum, all that stuff that I want these shows to have. Another good element was the tension with Trish as it's been kind of ratcheting up over the last couple of seasons. You get all the payoff of that in this season as she kind of becomes a hero, kind of becomes a super villain, plays into things really nicely as a character facing off against Jessica Jones that you care that these two people are battling each other head to head. Now, there is some lazy writing in here. I keep talking about, uh, it's nice that there's the investigation, they're trying to catch the guy, but 
they keep repeating these beats about the police can't find enough evidence to hold actual bad guys, but at the same time, very superficial stuff they're able to use against Jessica Jones. It just felt like they were cheating in the writing process of our villain happens to be super smart and our police happen to be super dumb. And adding to that, the same thing I mentioned about season two, the characters just aren't very likable at the end of the day. Some of them have some charm, some of them can be funny. You're rooting for them at times, but in general, they're not very likable. Still, I really had fun with this season. I was invested into it. I just wish they couldn't have tightened up the writing a little bit. Coming in at number seven, Luke Cage season one. I really enjoyed the first half of this season. Right out of the gate, it had this very cool aesthetic to it. The way it used music with this club inside of it, I thought it worked really nice even the color schemes, and just creating an atmosphere that was very distinct to this show that felt like it belonged in the universe with the other Marvel Netflix shows, but having a very distinct flavor to that. Add to that, Luke Cage as a character was just someone that I enjoyed as this reluctant hero that has this kind of troubled past, so he's not looking to jump into the spotlight, but he's a good guy that wants to do the right thing. And because he's trying to do the right thing, that interferes with our villains, who in the first half of the season were very cool, where you got Maria, you got Cottonmouth, and they're just characters that were trying to build this empire, and you kind of liked them. They had a nice swagger about them, and the way they were manipulating the city on kind of two fronts, the club, but the crime side of things, and then the politics over here with her. And I just enjoyed all of that, and the way it built tension with... Um, Luke Cage and him trying to do the right thing so he kind of stops them a little bit so they do a little bit of something back at him and then it keeps kind of escalating. All of that was working great for me and then they kill off Cottonmouth and the whole season kind of falls apart. Diamondback becomes our main villain. It gets a lot more cartoonish. It gets more melodramatic in the way that they handle uh, certain character interactions. It's campy. And honestly, as soon as they killed off Cottonmouth, it kind of killed the show. The show never recovered in this season or in the next season. But for me, that first half was strong enough that I still think that this is a good season worth checking out, though you can probably just stop watching as soon as Cottonmouth dies. Coming in at number six is The Punisher season two. Now this season started off with a set of episodes that I think are the best three or four episodes in either season of The Punisher, where Frank is kind of on the road trying to help this girl that's trying to get away from him, and they're being chased by these rel religious zealots who are just wiping people out, and it leads up to this episode where they're holed up at this police station. It's kind of like Rio Bravo, Assault in Precinct 13, except with Frank Castle, so you get some of those great moments where they finally let Frank just unleash on these guys, and it's great. And then we go back to New York City and it slows down for the whole middle of the season, unfortunately. Starts digging into the backstory of Jigsaw and his psychology and his journey to try and get back to normal and him not being able to remember what he did. And it's just the wrong show for that. It's the wrong direction to take Jigsaw in a Punisher TV series. Add to that, you got like Frank in certain episodes hold up in a... A hotel playing cards with the girl and you're like I don't I don't understand why is this what you would do with the Punisher TV series this is the totally wrong direction so it kind of grinded to a halt there for about four episodes and then our last four episodes it picks back up the religious cult zealot people you kind of figure out what the mystery is kind of going on with them and it combines with Jigsaw finally getting into action so it has a slam bang finale so it started great it ended great it's two bookends with a very kind of not so great center to this Punisher sandwich right here for me the highs for this season are a lot higher than season one but the lows are also a lot lower but in general there's enough highs in there to average it out to me having a good time with this season. Bringing this into the top five is Jessica Jones season one. This is a very cool exploration of a bunch of broken characters. And whereas I kind of criticize seasons two and three for the characters being unlikable because of how broken they are, it works in this season because we're getting to know them. We're being introduced to them and we're seeing their positive sides and their negative sides and you're understanding why they are the way that they are so we can kind of get over that hurdle of the fact that there's a bunch of things about them that we really don't like and that's kind of also the reason those other seasons I think were held back a little bit is we didn't see them move forward enough. But really at the center, the thing that drives this one forward is how despicable and vile the Purple Man character is in that he's someone that 
takes away other people's volition, their ability to choose their freedom, and uses it for his own selfish gain throughout the whole season. And you see this character that's very strong in Jessica Jones, physically very strong, invulnerable, but vulnerable when it comes to her ability to control herself. And this breaks her, the fact that this was done to her and the things that she did in the process and all the ways that it traumatizes throughout the season. It's fascinating, this exploration of someone with PTSD, someone who is working through their past demons and then has to face their past demons. All of this makes for an interesting, different addition to this this universe that we have right here, that you have someone super powered, but they're not really a superhero yet. There's someone trying to just fight through their own personal struggles, and that m makes for a very character-driven, captivating show. Coming in at number four is The Punisher season one. One part action series, one part political thriller, a whole bunch of revenge, a little bit of heroism, and a great performance from John Birdthaw and you get a great season of television and a nice addition to this universe. Of course, the big piece there is John Birdthaw is able to play this angry, broken character and give complexity to a character that has in the past been portrayed fairly linearly, very flat, one-dimensional, and he's able to add layers to it that you need for a television show to work and have a lead character that you care about and want to spend time with. And he can do that. He can have the brokenness. He can have a little bit of charm in the right moments. He can deliver very personal amounts of dialogue. And then he can be terrifying as the Punisher that punishes the people that have wronged him. Add to the mix, you get Karen Page. I think it just has a nice dynamic with him as this one character that seems to be able to break through the very dense thick, angry Punisher persona back to the human of Frank and pull that out of him. At the center here, we have kind of this political backstory about his uh, military background and these guys trying to cover things up and the connections back to Frank that he's got to unravel and take out all the people that kind of caused all the tragedy inside of his life. So there's a mystery side to it. There's uh, moral sides to inside of it, exploring what all he's doing. And there's, of course, ton of action as they set up a bunch of bad guys that you want taken out, and then more villains are revealed that you want to be taken out, leading to big slam bam payoff moments where he punishes a few people in some very visceral, <laughs> grotesque at times ways that just kind of stick in your brain in what he does to these people, which is exactly what I wanted from a Punisher series. Real quick, before I give you my top three, remember to share your ranking down below in the comment section. We're going to disagree. That's a good thing. Just don't be a jerk about it. Over the next few days, I'm going to be updating my rankings of the Marvel Netflix heroes and the Marvel Netflix villains. They're all going to be up in this playlist right up here. And if you're a little bit impatient, want to know my thoughts on some of this stuff in advance, you can click on that place to see my older version of the videos or come back in a few days to see the new updated versions. In third place is Daredevil season two, a fantastic follow-up season to the original season of Daredevil, especially the first four episodes where Daredevil's trying to stop the Punisher and you end up seeing their opposing worldviews as they get tied up on top of buildings and they're just having dialogue back and forth as you understand where each of them are coming from and you see kind of the grace and that Catholicism that is inside of Matt Murdock and the pure vengeance and practicality inside of the Punisher and it's written so well that them talking and clashing with words is just as interesting as them clashing with bad guys or punching each other in the face. Of course, as this is the Daredevil series, the action is all fantastic and distinctly memorable. Whether you're talking about the escape sequence where Daredevil goes in to get Frank, this season has another one of those long take fight sequences where Daredevil has to go down a stairwell with a chain attached to his head. All of it, very cool stuff. You got the prison fight scene with Frank. It's visceral, violent, gross at times, and all of it written so well. Even the dialogue later in the season, whether you're talking about Frank talking with Karen in a diner or little things in the trial, all of it worked so well for me. And then even on a deeper level, you've got the exploration of Matt Murdock trying to deal with the fact that he's a superhero and he's a Matt Murdock and he's not balancing it very well at all. Where it loses a little bit of steam here is when Elektra shows up kind of his plot line meanders a little bit while they go on some shenanigans. And then the stuff with the hand, 
they just they're not as compelling as they should be so it's not as strong as it could be even though you have a great setup with the Punisher and great moments throughout not quite as strong because the hand stuff doesn't land as well. Still a great season. Our runner up is Daredevil season one. This was a show that won me over immediately. Whether you're talking about just the aesthetics, the way that they like the show, the way they color it, the way they shoot certain sequences inside of it, of course the action sequences are fantastic and there's a whole bunch of actors giving great performances for these characters. But the standout is, of course, Vincent D'Onofrio as Kingpin, who's on this this other level with the quirky mannerisms and distinct idiosyncrasies that he gave to this character, who's both terrifying, very sensitive and vulnerable, and he needs a woman in his life to kind of balance him out and have someone that can kind of love him, but at the same time, he's this rage monster that will kill people and snap on a dime's notice, and he's brilliant, and he's a mastermind, and just makes for a great, compelling villain inside of this universe. As I mentioned before, the action here is fantastic, and they created a style to their show, both in the choreography of what this very acrobatic daredevil does in fight sequences, as well as this aesthetic of shooting the scenes in a way that you can see what is happening. Of course, the way that this is always done the best is each season has the long take fight sequence that are, all three of them are fantastic, and this one kind of started things off and got people talking about the show right out of the gate, like, did you see that whole fight scene? It was like five minutes long, and it, there's not a single cut in the fight choreography is fantastic, but it's not just that. It's also every fight sequence is shot in a way where it's wide enough with long enough uh, takes that you can see all the action and it's choreographed so well and makes sense with who they've designed this character to be and the fact that he's you know fighting ninjas in a whole bunch of this. Add to that the drama scene work, scenes work, the dialogue is compelling and interesting. Put it all together and you get a great season of television and the setup for one of my favorite TV shows of the last 10 years. But coming in in first place is Daredevil season three. It takes everything that worked about the previous two seasons and does it a little bit better and without having to deal with the hand plot line, it cleans up the story a good bit. At its center is Matt dealing with his demons, a crisis of faith, and trying to decide what does he believe, who does he want to be, and can he be both mad and daredevil at the same time? And it creates this center um, character study of him that runs throughout the whole season and the journey that he goes on in battling these different characters and Kingpin and Poindexter, that journey and his partnership with his friends and restoration of those friendships with them is what gives him a character arc. It helps him discover how he can be all the people he's supposed to be. Of course, once again, Kingpin is fantastic in this season, and he's even more the mastermind who's out thinking everyone and has a plan, and he's thought of all the things that could go wrong, and has a backup plan for all of his plans that you can't outthink him, you can't outplay him at his own game. Poindexter makes for a formidable physical threat to Daredevil throughout the entire season as you get to see this guy that, you know, can't miss any targets because he's bullseye, but he's also very mentally unhinged, and so that adds a nice dynamic into it as you watch him go crazier and crazier and crazier as the season goes along, and have some fun where you get two daredevils duking it out inside of these action sequences. But a big part of it, kind of what edges this one out on top for me, is that the central, central conflict of trying to bring down Kingpin requires that Matt be Matt Murdock. He has to work with Foggy. It has to have the criminal justice side to things, as well as the punching people in the face side of things as well. And that creates this very holistic season, whereas season two, I love things about it, but it kind of went in the wrong direction a few times. This one was the most focused, where there every Everything is in its prime. You get another one of these fantastic 12 minute long fight sequences and this time it's Charlie Cox in the sequence doing it which makes it even more impressive that it happened. So it's everything I love about one of my favorite shows of the last 10 years. Just a little bit better, better than the times it was already fantastic. So for me, this season comes in at number one. Remember to come back in a few days to check out my rankings of the heroes and the villains, or if you're watching in the future, you can just check out that playlist right over there to see those videos right now. 
Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies and TV too much.